<clears throat> right. Um, this, uh, the title of this talk is The Years at the Cape, from Dr. James Barry. And we'll see that Dr. Barry was here for uh, quite a long time, um, 12 years, which is a, the, her longest posting in, in any of the places where she worked. Um, so today we take her career forward. Try and put those glasses on. Take her career forward um, from October 1816 to September 1828. Um, that represented one quarter of Barry's entire army career, which is quite a quite a big chunk if you think of it. It was a time when there were um, uh, the events are extensively documented, particularly in our Western Cape ar archives. Um, much of it is in Barry's own hand, but his also uh, many of the documents are in the hand of his uh, secretary, um, uh, uh, Dr. Keith. Um, there were, it was a time when there were character moulding experiences which informed and coloured Barry's uh, subsequent practice and also um, enabled him to argue, he had such wide experiences here in the Cape that he was able to argue his case in virtually any post which he occupied subsequently, saying, well, I've experienced this, I've experienced that. He had experience which no normal army medical officer would have. So let's have a look at table one, please. <clears throat> this, um, I've looked at the, these um, uh, 12 years in three periods. Um, there's um, the first period when he was taken in hand by Lord Charles Somerset. The second period where he was made uh, a, 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 a colonial medical inspector. And the third period after he'd lost that post until he went off to Mauritius. <coughs> so, <coughs> uh, next one, slide, please. Uh, Dr. Barry arrived on the Indian Lord Cathcart, having avoided the uh, year without uh, a summer, and arrived in Cape Town. The, the, the uh, volcanic uh, ash went was largely in the northern hemisphere, and the southern hemisphere escaped this. And Barry arrived here. Um, in uh, Lord Cathcart in October 1816. <clears throat> As a urologist with an inquiring mind, I could see how Dr. Barry could uh, uh, defecate without getting um, uh, discovered to be anything other than a woman, but I couldn't work out how she managed to wee without being discovered. I know certain women are able to wee standing up, but that's not everybody's uh, cup of tea. <laughs> but if you look at the next slide, the, I, I, I turned up a book written by Joe J. Simmons III at a university in Colorado who investigated these, um, the uh, sanitary, shall we say, sanitary habits of ships from the earliest days. And the answer for Dr. Barry was in here, in the, the, uh, uh, court, the quarter galleries. This is a very fancy double-storied loo. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the seats of ease, as they're called, around here and around here, and they aren't exactly on top of each other, they're, they're, they're actually staggered. So the pipes go down and they don't sort of, the person sitting in the bottom doesn't get an awful shock all of a sudden. So that is how Dr. Barry, as an officer, and not a crew member, a passenger, was <coughs> able to use this, these facilities. <coughs> Um, <coughs> hi. Um, so, uh, Dr. Barry uh, landed at Cape Town. There were, the, there were little boats to take people ashore. And she, first of all, went to the next slide, please. Went to the castle. This is quite a nice aerial picture of the castle, which, uh, uh, from which the garrison, the most garrisons had about two and a half thousand men in them. And they functioned from, from the, the castle, and the men were housed in barracks here. And um, uh, the, uh, uh, the military hospital was situated, next one, please. The, this is a very typical British military hospital. Uh, they were big or small, but they all looked like that. That was on, almost on Woodstock Beach, at roughly the place where, I think it's called Chris Barnard Boulevard, 
there's a big uh, road which goes across down to um, uh, down to the docks, and that hospital was situated approximately there, and that is where Barry was supposed to work. Um, <coughs> the officers tended not to live in the barracks. And next slide, please. Dr. Barry stayed at, with the at the widow Sandenberg's uh, house at number uh, 12 Hirnkracht, which is is this building over here. This has actually got 13. That goes there, and this looks like number 12. And um, he, st he, st he stayed there for the entire time. He, not the entire time, but for the first time that he was in, in Cape Town. Um, <clears throat> Soon, the new medical officer um, came to the attention of the governor, who at that time was Lord Charles Somerset. And um, let's, let's have the next slide, please. <laughs> this is a picture of Somerset in Powderham Castle in Devon. Uh, he married the, uh, um, the daughter of the, um, of the Earl, and um, he was the governor of, uh, of the Cape Colony, which is a big, uh, go a big governorate. Um, he came, Barry came armed with a letter from, um, uh, from Lord, um, um, the Earl of, sorry, I've just forgotten the name, the Scottish Earl, and uh, he, uh, he had reason to know Lord Charles Somerset because Somerset and the Earl's brother were both um, uh, privy councillors to George the Fourth, and both of them had married in the same way. They'd uh, eloped with their respective girlfriends and got married at Gretna Green, which is not really what you would expect, <laughs> expect from Lord Charles, but th that is in fact what happened. And uh, no doubt um, that would have been, a, uh, those were common experiences in the family and uh, uh, that would have been known by Lord uh, um, Charles Dickens, who seemed to know r quite a lot about Dr. Barry, um, uh, stated that um, he, uh, Barry had a letter of introduction uh, uh, to Lord Charles Somerset, and um, he, he wrote in his, um, his book, um, nearly half a century ago, a young fellow with a smartish air, though of small and ill-proportioned figure, landed at the Cape of Good Hope, bringing letters of introduction to the governor from a well-known and eccentric Scottish nobleman. <clears throat> it's of interest to know that that's, that's what um, uh, 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 it's st stated. At this particular time, S Somerset had very much lost his faith in the medical profession at the Cape, because the previous year, his wife, uh, they were a devoted couple, and Somerset loved her dearly. She uh, unfortunately developed an illness which proved fatal, and it sounds from the description as if she had um, peri a peritonsular abscess which of course would be streptococcal in origin and at that, that time there was no treatment. So Lady Charles sadly died, leaving Lord Charles a widower at a relatively younger, young age. And so he was in the state of mind when a new young doctor, strange looking doctor, comes along uh, to actually uh, dump the, the, the ones who've been, who were traditionally um, qualified and take to this new one who had a, enjoyed a very good reputation. And that, <coughs> uh, that um, uh, significantly improved Barry's um, uh, prospects in, in the Cape because very soon he found himself literally at the top table with Somerset and, uh, and guests who came to the Cape and um, Somerset in fact then started to promote Barry as a good doctor um, to other people and not only here in Cape but people in, on St Helena advising the governor to send his wife to see Dr Barry and um, so it looked very um, promising professionally for Dr Barry although Barry was still an army doctor. Um, <clears throat> just a few facts about Lord Charles Somerset. Um, 
He was um, a member of the, uh, a descendant of, the, of John of Gaunt. Uh, uh, Gaunt is, uh, was a, a term at the time for the city of Ghent in, in Belgium. And uh, John of Gaunt was a, a Plantagenet, and in the Wars of the Roses, <coughs> virtually all Plantagenets except Gaunt's descendants were, were killed in various wars. And the only reason for that is that uh, these, this family that he had was not his only family. He had his legitimate family, but then he had a, um, a mistress. Um, let's have the next slide. This is um, the castle in um, Beaufort Castle in the upper reaches of the uh, of the the. Uh, um, uh, in France, one of the great rivers, and he kept this family in this this castle. Um, uh, and w during the Wars of the Roses, as people got killed off, <coughs> the, the, this young family was uh, was spared, and they became the earls of earls of Exeter, the Duke of Beaufort, and that sort of thing. And Lord Charles was descended from that line. He um, he. He frequently suffered from a bad press, especially in England. He wasn't very popular, although he'd, um, uh, he, he would, he'd been to Oxford University, he'd qualified. He was a soldier, um, and uh, he was also a member of Parliament. In fact, most of his uh, numerous brothers, I think he had six brothers, were either in Parliament or soldiers. And um, <coughs> the youngest brother, Lord Fitzroy Somerset, um, be, uh, became known to James Barry. He was a little bit older than she was, um, but he occupied a very important position as the personal secretary to the head of the armed forces in, uh, in government, and he was able to assist Dr. Barry on uh, the several occasions when she got into trouble. Um, Somehow or other, Barry would get, uh, get and we'll come across some of these instances uh, s shortly, and although they were um, uh, very contrary to uh, the army rules, somehow or other, Barry never seemed to suffer too badly from these things. <clears throat> now let's look at um, uh, uh, the first period of Barry's um, time here. Obviously, it's not possible for us to go into all of this. It's just, there's just too much here. And we'll look at a couple of things. Um, uh, we've seen there, uh, Lord Charles, some. This, this, the Count de las Casas was um, a French nobleman, ennobled by Napoleon, uh, who was uh, Napoleon's sort of um, gopher. He, uh, um, when Napoleon had, had uh, suffered defeat at uh, Waterloo, de las Casas uh, went down to uh, La Rochelle to see if he could um, uh, get a, um, a, a ship for him to escape. And in fact, when going out of Paris, it was de las Casas who was in the coach looking a bit like Napoleon, so all the anger of the people were throwing stones at the coach. <laughs> Napoleon wasn't inside it. He was some, somewhere else. So Las Casas did this. And on St. Helena, Las Casas was found to have had inside his waistcoat some secret plans for Napoleon to escape. The Americans were very pro-Napoleon, anti-British, because <coughs> it wasn't all that time long after the American War of Independence and Las Casas was tr trying to facilitate an escape. And he was um, nabbed by the uh, authorities and sent to Cape Town uh, as about the, the nearest faraway place that he could get to. And he was put in the castle with his son. He had a 14-year-old son with him. And um, uh, the son wasn't um, very well, and they wanted a doctor, and they, Dr. Barry was sent to him. And Las Casas wrote in his memoirs, <coughs> um, he wrote, I mistook the, ca the captain of the ship that brought him, the ship was a, a, a brig called Griffin, he said, I mistook the captain's medical friend for his son or nephew. The grave doctor who was presented to me was a boy of 18 with the form, manners, and voice of a woman. So uh, 
Barry's um, uh, disguise wasn't impenetrable. And we can come again, we will come up against that later by far simpler people in Las Casas. Anyway, the accommodation in the castle for Las Casas and his son were pretty dire. And, oops, sorry, something is happening. Um, and uh, the Count complained and wrote a letter to uh, uh, Lord Charles uh, complaining about this. And just at that time, uh, Somerset was about to go to the Eastern Cape um, to talk to uh, uh, Gaika about the uh, coming to some arrangement to stop the Corsa from uh, marauding and uh, uh, killing, stealing cattle and killing the farmers. The, this was an ongoing thing, and Somerset was planning a major expedition. And. Um, so two things came out of that. Firstly, his own home Newlands, at Newlands House was going to be vacant, and he made that available to Las Casas and his son. And he also wanted to take a doctor along with him, and Dr. Barry got this amazing opportunity. Can you imagine an Irish girl from, from uh, uh, Cork setting out on an, on an expedition, in, literally into what were the wilds of Africa? Fantastic. So um, the expedition was mounted, <coughs> and that was early in 1817. And it took, it was a big three month adventure. Let's just, uh, that is Count Las Casas, and he was, um, next slide please. That is Newland's house where um, he was able to um, relax in security. And this is the route which they took. They first ha had to get over this Pottenkotz Kloof Pass, which is a, um, was a very fearsome pass to get over the Hottentots Holland Mountains. There was a 20% wagon loss rate every year on that. It was pretty, bi pretty bad. And then they went uh, through here. They went, probably went to uh, um, Hook and uh, Swellendam over there, and then the Choritz River. Mossel Bay, and then they went along the coast, and they were entertained in um, uh, in Neisner by um, uh, George um, Rex, and uh, Barry um, tried to teach the children um, uh, uh, things, teach her the things, uh, simple things, and the children particularly called her the Kopuknoyanki because they recognized that she wasn't uh, without the inhibition of an adult. They recognized that this, this person was a woman, a little young girl, Noyanki, and Kapok, because she, her clothes were stuffed with Kapok at that stage to try to beef her up a bit. So um, these are all little things which come out in the wash. Um, <coughs> next slide, please. The, these are Chemsbuk on the way in, uh, uh, sorry, Bontebuk. Um, we owe the, the existence of these animals today to Lord Charles Somerset because the, the, the Bondebok had an unfortunate habit of when he heard a shot, instead of running away, he stood and looked at the shot. And so they were an easy target and they were getting wiped out. And Lord Charles, uh, as he put in his proclamation, he forbade the destruction of these animals. And so we have him to thank that Bondebok is still around these days. Next one, please. Sorry. Let's go back, yes. So um, we eventually, yes, next slide, please. There is a cartoon of Lord Charles Somerset. He was a great equestrian, uh, very, very um, much into horses. And uh, there he is in full glory going off on his trip to, uh, um, uh, to the Cut River where they were going to have this Congress. <coughs> there was the excitement of going down the Choritz River and up on the other side, 200 feet down into this uh, uh, river at the bottom. And um, uh, they finally got to, uh, got to the, um, uh, the Cut River, and uh, Geica, they established a, a, a very um, uh, in, imposing tent and things, a large number of officers. Dr. Barry was there with his dress uniform, soldiers, cannon, everything. And when Geica and his, 
his fellow chieftains came to the other side of the river. It didn't, uh, it didn't instill confidence in them. They were a bit frightened about this, which is understandable. And a couple of Landrost had to go across the river and literally frog march him across the river to this meeting at which the terms were explained by Lord Charles. And then Geico was given a whole lot of gifts, um, most of which you and I would probably describe as trinkets. And then having got those, he whisked off back across the river and disappeared into the undergrowth. So that was, um, that was the, uh, the thing. Um, the expedition returned via Hrafrenet, <coughs> where Barry met uh, Andre Stockenstrom, whom he was to meet uh, a few times subsequently. <coughs> In that December 1870, Barry was appointed physician to his excellency which carried with it a grace and favour house, cottage, in the gardens of Government House. Seven mo several months later, Lord Charles went down with a typhoid fever, uh, which wasn't good news, and Barry, uh, there wasn't a lot that could be done about it because the cause wasn't known. So Dr Barry actually nursed Lord Charles personally, and fortunately he was among the... Uh, um, 70 odd percent who survived without treatment. But the, um, the, the, the government schooner, Mary, was ready to take bad news to London if necessary, and fortunately, Mary had to, was able to stand down after a bit. Um, not for nothing was Cape Town known as the Tavern of the Seas. Every ship going from Europe to India on the Far East uh, really had to stop at Cape Town because the, it, the long uh, stretches from Europe uh, meant that they, the ship had to reprovision. And um, uh, there were hundreds, thousands of, uh, of sailors and soldiers, um, many of whom left their genetic uh, markers here in Cape Town. And because the biggest and the most prosperous uh, brothel in, in the place was the Company Slave Lodge. So the Dutch East India Company had um, um, profited from this uh, slave lodge. <coughs> and I don't know whether it's, um, it was foreseeing the future, but it's uh, maybe odd that it's right next to the Houses of Parliament these days. <laughs> don't tell me when I said that. So <clears throat> what this meant was that there was this uh, huge brothel uh, at the top of Adderley Street, and it also served a purpose to sort of um, increase the number of slaves that were available to, for, for sale around Cape Town, but it also provided uh, an opportunity for midwives and accoucheurs to learn how to deliver babies. And Dr. Barry was, that was one of the, uh, um, one of the, the uh, f factors, one of the things that he was, had to oversee, although he deputed the, uh, the, that duty to other people who were practicing midwives at the time. <coughs> um, there was an interesting thing. Uh, does the name Sir May Ring Beck mean, ring a bell here? Sir hmm? so Mayring Beck was one of the early uh, and a very exceptionally distinguished president of the uh, Medical Society of South Africa. And he reported on, um, uh, on one of his annual reports, he reported the birth of, to, of twins to a black woman in the slave lodge, one of the children of whom was a, a typically black person with uh, frizzy hair and the other was a, was a white child or a slightly colored child. And this was said to be, the woman said she'd had one client who was a black man and one quiet client who was a white man shortly after that, and it was attributed to a, a double insemination. <coughs> now, I wonder if that wouldn't perhaps be, uh, if, is there anyone here who's into genetics? No, but if you've got the person who with, uh, I, I don't know what the names, numbers and the, the genes for skin pigmentation are, but if you've got two pe people with, uh, let's call it one B, large B and one small B, um, 
uh, or uh, one large W and a small W, or you may well get a, a, a white child coming from a black person. And there was a well-known case that happened in the Netherlands not all that many years ago of a woman who'd had artificial insemination in a laboratory, and uh, she produced twins, one of whom was black and one of whom was white. Those are the Stuart twins. So, uh, Sir Marion Beck might have been correct, but uh, it was just an interesting observation. <coughs> Dr. Barry's idiosyncrasies were well known and by no means few in number. Um, well illustrated by the story of Mrs. Clutey. Mrs. Clutey was, uh, li lived at uh, Great Westerford, down, down the road here, and she was seriously ill with pneumonia. And eventually, all the local remedies having failed, Dr. Barry was called in. And uh, I'll just read this to, uh, description by Mrs. Clutie's daughter. <coughs> um, she said that um, as soon as the doctor entered the room, he stamped his foot on the floor, rushed to the window, and flung it open. The atmosphere had been like a hot oven. He then went over to the door, opened it, and allowed a full current of fresh air to pass through the room. Then he turned on the patient. What he saw was a four-poster bed covered round with thick hanging curtains. In a frenzy, he tore the curtains apart and then proceeded to give the bewildered Mrs. Clutey uh, and her mournful attendants such a scolding that they had never had before. Barry then waltzed out, leaving instructions the room was to be kept well ventilated. Now, th from that very moment, Mrs. Clutey rallied, and Barry's reputation reached another boost. Now, probably, um, I'm one of the few people here old enough to remember b about lobo pneumonia before antibiotics arrived. But there's a condition, not ordinary pneumonia that we get these days, but lobar pneumonia, which is caused by a particular pneumococcus, would affect the whole lobe of the lung, and that was uh, very fatal, but not always, because it gave the body time. If the body had time to develop antibodies to the pneumococcus, it could actually, the patient would be terribly sick, and the antibodies would reach a critical level, and within a very short space of time, there'd be a huge improvement. And I've read this story from Mrs. Um, Mrs. Clutie's uh, daughter, and I think that there's the possibility of that, that that represented a crisis in a case of low bone pneumonia. <clears throat> Unable to accept a fee, and indeed r rather better than a fee, Mrs. Clutie lent the doctor a pair of magnificent black horses for the rest of her um, stay in Cape Town, as well as a wagon load of annual forage, a uh, wagon load of forage annually, which he enjoyed until finally departing from the Cape in 1828. <coughs> um, uh, the Cape, there were numerous visitors to the Cape, not all of whom who went to the uh, slave lodge. Um, the Honourable George Keppel, the, later the fifth Earl of Albemarle, was one of them. And he had heard about this strange doctor in Cape Town, and he asked if he could uh, um, meet her at, at a mess. And he said, he wrote, There was at this time at the Cape a person whose eccentricities attracted universal attention. Dr. James Barry, staff surgeon to the garrison. Lord Charles described him to me as the most skillful of physicians and the most wayward of men. Keppel went on, I beheld a beardless lad, apparently about my own age, with an unmistakable Scotch type of countenance, reddish hair, high cheekbones. There was a certain effeminacy um, uh, in her manner, which he, which he always seemed striving to overcome. His style of conversation was greatly superior to that that one usually hears in, at mess tables. And I thought that was quite a, a, an insightful um, opinion of what Dr. Barry was like at this stage of life. 
Um, then let's have the next slide. That is the, sorry, I'm going ahead of myself. That is the, uh, the ground floor plan of the old, uh, the slave lodge, and you can see it's ideally t uh, built for, uh, f to be a brothel. <laughs> you couldn't have, look at, you couldn't count these rooms. <laughs> Let's have the next one, please. This is uh, this is young Josiah, Captain Josiah Clitty, and we're going to talk about him now. Um, he uh, Lord, he was the secretary to Lord Charles Somerset, and um, Doctor. On one occasion, Doctor Barry was there in the antechamber, and Lord Charles was, as I said, closeted with um, a woman from uh, the, up in the, the uh, Huntenberg and for a long time. And Barry said, um, uh, Barry, I say Clutie, Barry sneered, <coughs> that's a nice Dutch filly the governor's got hold of. Retract your vile expression, you infernal little cad, said I advancing and pull his, his long, ugly nose. Barry immediately challenged me, and we fought with pistols. In, the, in those days, it, to, um, to insult anybody, particularly in respect of a woman, was an absolute no-no. I mean, it simply wasn't done. Um, it appears to be very popular to these days in high places in London, but not now. But um, so uh, it was an automatic challenge to a duel. And the duel was fought. Let's have the slide, next slide, please. The new duel was fought at Alphen. We recognize Alphen here. The, the, the venue was said to be on the slightly lower lawn. And um, next slide, please. The, the, this is a box of pistols. Now, I just want to, is, <coughs> I, I read somewhere that the actual pistols used in this duel are in somewhere in South Africa, and Natal is mentioned. I would just love to see them, and if anybody knows anything about their whereabouts, please let me know, because I would just love to see these. Um, but this is a very characteristic pair of late, uh, of early 19th century pistols. And... Um, the, uh, the a doctor present in two seconds. Next slide, please. This um, does anyone r recognize this? This is a painting of uh, um, Lenski and uh, Eugene Onegin fighting their duel. Um, this is one of Ilya Repin's um, uh, paintings. I don't know if, if you're familiar with the, the art of Repin. He's an artist who I admire enormously. And um, this duel uh, actually foretold uh, um, uh, the actual death of um, of, uh, um, of Pushkin himself, who was killed in a duel. <coughs> So, uh, you know, I haven't got a picture of the duel fought between Barry and, uh, and uh, Clutie, but it w would have been like this, but only not in the snow. Lenski was killed. Repin uh, um, uh, Onyegin was a skilled uh, duelist, and he would had lots of practice. Lenski was a much simpler, younger man, and Repin had made overtures. Sorry, to his, at least uh, um, Onyegin had made overtures to Lenski's girlfriend, and that was the reason why there was the, 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 the duel. Um, it was nobody was killed, but blood was drawn. <laughs> Um, and the only description of that, the, the fight between Clutie and Barry, was from Clutie himself. Barry never mentioned anything of it at all, but Clutie, years later at a mess, mentioned, gave the, gave the story in his terms. Was, and, was Clutie the uh, son of that uh, original Mrs. Clutie the, that he had looked after? Um, the Clutie, Clutie was one of the, the Alphen Cluties. Yeah. He was the he was the chap described as an English speaking the the British the red coated British officers who were du who spoke Dutch in the tower, <laughs> and the fa the family still um, own, own the, the, the the building. Um, 
The last thing I want to say about the, no, Lord Charles also, um, there were two things he was responsible. He was imported ep- excellent bloodstock. Um, uh, he was an outstanding and a recognised um, uh, 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 assessor of horse flesh. And he brought a colt from a, um, a, a stud called um, Sorcerer. And I looked Sorcerer up, and Sorcerer, believe it or not, still has his own web page in the, on the internet. Although the animal, this is, we're talking about a late 18th century animal. He was such, he was such an outstanding stud that uh, you can, if you can Google Sorcerer and up will come a web page. Um, Let's look at this, the, uh, the next one. This is, um, <coughs> this is the second, second period. Again, you can see this was a very busy time for Dr. Barry. All of these were within his, um, uh, within his uh, um, brief. And um, it's obviously impossible to go, th- go through all these, so I'll just mention one or two of them. Um, <coughs> He, Lord Charles, after the death of his wife, Lord Charles went back to England and he came back with a new wife uh, who uh, was already pregnant when she arrived here. And uh, so just about that time, the uh, colonial medical inspector it was a Dr. Rob, and he came into some money. And so without wasting time, he retired, resigned from the army, and went back to England. So um, Dr. Barry, who'd worked with Lord Charles now for a while, was um, appointed the colonial medical inspector. And this was the, the sort of uh, um, a, a bunch of stuff that he was, um, that he was supposed to do. Now... Um, what I'm, uh, the, let's look at this one, the case of Joris. Amongst his things was uh, medico-legal um, um, opinions um, from medical time. So um, Joris was a slave who was beaten to death by the son of a uh, Dutch reform minister in Paul. And um, uh, uh, he, the, the, sla- the slave was owned by the Reverend Gebhardt of Simon's Flay, which is still there, of course. And Gerard's son, Willem, was alleged to have beaten him to death because he thought Jor- Joris... Joris is the Dutch word for George. Joris was, uh, uh, was not working hard enough. A fellow slave who'd walked to Paul and reported the matter to the magistrate, who was Mr. van Reinefeld, and he requested an autopsy. And Dr. Shand, who an ex-Royal Naval doctor, did the autopsy, and he reported massive soft tissue damage to Joris's back and organs. And um, the family didn't want to believe this, and so they in, uh, invited a Dr. Tardieu from Paul to do a second autopsy, which he did. And his um, opinion was that there were just simply a few scratches on the back and that Joris had died from bulimia, which is another fancy word for gluttony. I mean, this is a ridiculous thing. Faced with these conflicting reports, Lord Charles sought Dr. Barry's opinion. And Barry said that, uh, described Tardieu's report as the most incorrect and unprofessional production that I have ever seen or heard of. Subsequently, Tardieu was struck off the roll as a doctor, and young Gevolt was executed. So um, that was uh, one of the things that he had to do. Then Barry also had to um, assess the uh, qualifications of new doctors coming to the Cape Colony. And there was one doctor called Mr. Gerd, an immigrant prospective doctor, and Barry uh, saw him and um, tested him. And um, uh, he said... He wrote to the governor, I have this day seen Mr. Gerd and examined his, uh, his indentures and professional acquirements and regret to say that Mr. Gerd appears so perfectly ignorant of every branch of the medical profession as to be totally unqualified to practice in this colony. You can't have it much straighter than that. And over the following seven months, Mr. Gerd must have done some pretty intensive revision for when he next saw the co- co- colonial medical inspector on the 21st of November, Dr. Barry recommended that he be pres- allowed to practice. So that's that. 
Um, next slide, please. The Somerset Hospital. <coughs> now, this is the original Somerset Hospital, the old Somerset Hospital, and this was privately established by an ex-Royal Naval doctor who happened to come from Malmesbury in, uh, in England. It was um, Dr. S Dr. Bailey, and he saw the, uh, he called in at the Cape on one of his, on one of the naval ships, liked it and decided to come back to Cape Town. And um, he saw the need for a hospital and he put every penny of his own money into building this place. And that is the one side of the hospital. I think this is the on faced onto Prestwich Street. The thing which slightly worried me was this, this picture was taken in 1934, which was just the year before I was born. So um, it makes me feel very ancient to see this, this building up here. And um, so he built the hospital and um, it was all right for a while, but it simply, um, uh, Bailey simply didn't have the money to, to run a public hospital. And um, it fell into uh, um, disrepute, and um, <coughs> Somerset uh, wanted um, Barry to go and assess the hospital, uh, and um, he wrote a very, very long report. But his, the first visit was on the 4th of March, 1824, and he wrote, I visited the Somerset Hospital today. The whole establishment appears void of cleanliness, order, or professional care. An old woman, Mina, about 100, in her second childhood, requiring only her, her modest way, only the necessities of life, this poor creature had neither bed nor blanket. A man named Casement, whose labours under so severe an injury to the head, totally neglected, therefore I beg to recommend that His Excellency, as a proper obje uh, object, to be uh, admitted to the military hospital. And then there were other cases like this. Barry concluded, a general reform of some kind is necessary in this establishment, which certainly does not deserve to be dignified with the title of a hospital. And eventually a, head, a committee headed by Dr. Barry calculated, evaluated the whole matter, the whole hospital, and came up with an extraordinary report which would be uh, an exemplar of a, a report on a, on a failing institution even to this day. Amazing. And it was all written by Barry and um, uh, the most, many of the uh, recommendations were put in hand. Included in that report was this uh, plan of the hospital. This is difficult to see because most of the hospital it consisted of a courtyard. But these, uh, these uh, wards up here are the ones that one could see on that photograph uh, there. So I think Presswood Street probably ran, ran along there. But they had slaves in there, various pe people. Uh, it was, it was, Barry was quite right. It did not deserve to be called a hospital. Um, the, the, the new Somerset Hospital uh, was built, do, do you remember this one? Yes, the New Summers Hospital was built in about 1864-65, that's the year Dr. Barry died, and um, it served Cape Town for many, many years. Um, I myself had some of my tuition there when I was a medical student, and I even operated there when I was in practice um, on, on occasions, patients got in there. And uh, that, was a, uh, that was a very good institution. Um, Take that there. Now the next one, to, the next thing that Lord Charles wanted Barry to look at was the trunk. And uh, trunk, uh, according to Jean Branford, the word trunk comes from the Malay word trunku, which means uh, to imprison. Um, I believe what she says. Um, <coughs> uh, on only one occasion have I sp spent a night in a police cell. Um, I, I was actually driving from Salisbury to Umtali to see Nora Wright, who was a, a, a very good uh, GMO there, and I went on uh, down towards Melseta along the line of the Chamani Mani Mountains. And when I got to Melseta, it was uh, getting dark, and there was an, there was not no room at the inn. There was no inn, so I went and knocked on I knocked on the door of the police station, and a very helpful policeman came out, and he said, "Yes, of course we can accommodate you for the night." 
<laughs> and the following morning, the Chimani Mani Mountains are east of Melseta, separating what was uh, Zimbabwe now from uh, uh, Mozambique. And the sunshine on January the 2nd in the morning was an absolutely an amazing sight. And I have a photograph of that somewhere, but I just can't find it amongst all the other stuff. So, um, but here in Cape Town, the trunk didn't have a reputation like that. Um, it had a very sinister reputation. Let's have the next slide, please. It was situated, I was, someone asked me very recently, where was the trunk? Um, there is the Heerenkracht, sorry. There's the Heerenkracht, and the trunk, the, uh, this is Strand Street, and the continuation was called Justice Street, Justice Street. And um, this area here is where the rail, Cape Town Railway Station is. And there were two things there. There was the trunk on this side and the custom house on this side. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Here's a, p a picture of those two buildings. Here you can see the trunk. And there's the custom house. And here you see two dinars with some unfortunate person they've, uh, that they've collected along the way. Now, you've, uh, there was, you hear about, um, in reports and things, you hear about rede redaction taking place, editing. And I want to show you a, a, a graphic example of redaction. Please, the next slide, please. There you find the, s the same buildings and the same dinars, but the chap who's being t the ha manhandled has disappeared. Why that was done, I don't know. Perhaps they were trying to publicize this and make, it, make them look uh, kind of people, but that, uh, there we are. But um, uh, Somerset asked Barry to, uh, to go, carry out periodic inspections of the trunk. On April the 16th, 1824, accompanied by Mr. Kekovich, who was a judge of the Admiralty Court, Dr. Barry um, went to pass through the gate into the courtyard. There's the gate. No, not, not just yet, please. Um, Barry was horrified by what he, what he saw in the trunk. I beg leave to state that I visited the trunk in company with Mr. Kekovich, and in a dungeon of that place, I found Jacob Elliott, with his thigh fractured, without clothes, without a bed, or pillows, or blankets, dirty in the extreme, without a single comfort, in short, exhibiting such a state of misery that had he not been under the special protection of providence, he could not have survived. I do here, my lord, declare that I have never witnessed any scene more appalling than this. Mr. Kekovich went out in disgust. With rather black humor, Barry then asked the keeper if he had any more broken bones, and was surprised to hear only one. With rather bl um, I requested the keeper to conduct me to the patient, and in one of the cells I found Jan Creer as near as possible in point of humane treatment in the same predicament with Elliot. This poor wretch had one of his legs fractured, and the other was carefully surrounded by a heavy chain. So uh, Barry made his feelings absolutely clear about the, the state of things there. And the next one, the treadmill, was a, a ca comparative innovation. It was uh, invented by Cubitt, the English engineer, to provide um, a pointless form of exercise to keep prisoners busy, physically occupied, without actually achieving anything which is quite a, quite a, a, a goal. Um, uh, uh, Lord Bathurst, who was the um, colonial secretary, gave Somerset permission to build a treadmill in the prison. To be on the safe side, he, just to be on the safe side, he ordered three to be installed. And this is uh, uh, Tandikaya, who's one of the very, a very personable guide at the uh, um, breakwater, at the uh, Siobhan prison, Siobhan battery. And he took me to show me the tr this uh, treadmill. And I think this is one of the original three treadmills that was installed because it's not a cheap thing. 
to make. Um, this prison, the Breakwater Prison, came on stream at just the time when Ruland Street, uh, when the uh, town prison closed, and they would have taken one out of there and installed it here. <coughs> Next slide, please. This is a, a classic picture of, this is in Jamaica, where treadmills were used on an epic scale. And you can see the, uh, the inhumane treatment of slaves. This one's being lashed. Here they've a whole bunch of men and women slaves, and this one, the overseer's got to lash himself. And here, this is probably either an owner or an agent talking to somebody, r r relatively unperturbed by the whole going on. <laughs> Now, the other, one of the other things in this period of, um, of Barry's uh, tenure as a uh, colonial medical or principal medical officer is the, the next one slide, please, was the question of the, the leper colony. Lord Charles had um, uh, instituted, a, he'd bought property in um, the mountains between Hermanus and Caledon and started a leper colony. And um, they had uh, two buildings. This building was, uh, was supposed to be for a doctor. Uh, quite a nice little building, some horse boxes there. There was an uh, examination room and uh, various other rooms in here. And there was also, just the next slide, please. Uh, this is called a, pl uh, a, 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 a place for the, um, for the, for the lepers. Now, I, th I believe this is probably a, a, a hospital for, for sick lepers, but the, most of the lepers were um, koi koi or san, and they didn't like living in a building like this. They preferred to make their own, uh, their own huts. <coughs> now, uh, Somerset bought this farm in 1817, and um, I don't know if any of you, do you know, do any of you know where it is? It, as you go out of Hermanus, up the, up the pass, Arda. It's now, this farm is now owned by a, a, a retreat, a, a Christian retreat called Fulmut. You know Fulmut? Well, I've, I haven't stayed at Fulmut, but Angela and I went to visit it. Uh, we were invited to visit it um, a few months ago. And I must say, it is an absolute, looks like an absolutely amazing place. And uh, if I ever f find that I need somewhere to go and meditate, I think I would like to go to Fulmut. That's not an advert, not a commercial. Um, so um, Dr. Barry w uh, was asked to go and look at this um, uh, leper colony. And by horse with his uh, servant, he r rode from town across the Cape Flats over the uh, um, Hottentots Kloof Pass, which had a very sinister reputation from the point of view of difficulty. And there was the river at the top, which he had to get across, and then um, uh, canter along quite a few miles to Caledon and then down. So it's a, it was quite a long ride. And when he got there, what he saw did not please him. Um, the first inspection was in October 1822, and it was, his report was damning, resulting in the sacking of the supervisor, the minister, and the doctor. All three of them were kicked out. And um, then the, uh, the, uh, the uh, mission at uh, Genardendal put a, a brother Leitner into the place to try to, try to bring it right. His life history was exceptionally interesting, but we can't go into that now. Now more trouble started because Barry imagined that he was in charge of the leper colony and Brother Leitner had been told that he was in charge of the leper colony. So you had an irreconcilable problem here and eventually Lord Charles stepped in after many months of wrangling to say that uh, brother, if Brother Leitner had a patient who he thought needed medical attention, uh, he could... Um, uh, get in touch with the, through the government office to get Dr. Barry to go and see them. Barry was deeply offended by this. And, um, but um, 
Not long thereafter, Barry had other problems, and uh, which in fact solved, solved this particular issue. Um, then there was another thing called, the, which I've called the placard affair. Um, <coughs> the here's, this is the Heerenkracht. There is a little bridge over the Heerenkracht, and these are houses alongside here. And one winter's day in, um, uh, in June uh, uh, 1824, uh, a captain, sea captain who lived here went out onto his balcony and he saw a, a placard, a notice stuck on that bridge, which people did. And he went to look at it and it said the following. Even the sea captain appeared to be a bit shocked by this. A person living at Newlands makes it known to the public authorities of this colony that on the fifth instant he detected Lord Charles buggering Dr. Barry. The person is ready to come and make oath to the above. <coughs> well, within minutes, that uh, placard was taken down. They were never found out quite who it was. Um, and Lord Charles was uh, equally embarrassed by this, annoyed, and he placed the matter in the hands of the fiscal, who immediately established the inquiry. The fiscal was a, a very tough Dutch chap, and... Um, he was a very effective uh, legal man. Uh, persons known to bear a grudge against the governor were interrogated, including George Gregg, who was a Scottish radical who just established a newspaper which annoyed the governor. And uh, there was also a chap called William Edwards in jail who um, caused a lot of legal trouble. <coughs> uh, that's putting it shortly. And eventually the, the, it quickly came to the court and the, there is a whole volume of court stuff written here. The court interpreters were uh, Dutch to English but um, they were usually Irish people. And there was trying to write, write the word, obviously the word buggering was unfamiliar to them because you can look and you see it's crossed out and then spelt differently and it's crossed out again. It really is quite amusing to, to read this. But anyway, the, the, it was eventually decided that it was, to, it was this chap, um, uh, um, William Edwards, who was uh, um, guilty and he was put on a ship and sent off to Australia. <coughs> but then a, 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 a letter from Governor Brisbane from, from Australia came to Lord Charles pointing out that this chap had been in Australia himself, the, he'd, a previous prisoner. He'd been endless trouble there, endless trouble, uh, and caused trouble amongst other people, fermented trouble. And he was finally um, exiled to Norfolk Island now, do you know, the only thing I know about Norfolk Island is it has a pine tree. But Norfolk Island is about a thousand miles east of Australia. And Lockheye eventually ended up there and committed suicide. But um, you, you read the story about Dr. Barry and you find all sorts of other stuff comes out of the woodwork. So that was Dr. Barry. Um, uh, no, uh, let's see, that's the final thing, the final nail in the coffin of Barry and the fiscal was the matter of Aaron Smith. Um, Aaron Smith was, no, we, uh, not quite there yet. Aaron Smith was a, um, a drunk and he'd tested his housebreaking skills in Strand Street and unfortunately the house he chose belonged to the fiscal. And um, the, he very soon found himself in jail. And um, the doctor on duty for the jail went to see him and thought that he was raving mad and wanted the fiscal to admit the man to, uh, as a psychiatric case, to Somerset Hospital. Dr. Barry saw the patient. Uh, that didn't happen. Barry saw the patient the following morning, by which time he'd sobered up. And he... Um, made a big mistake. He made two big mistakes. Firstly, 
he thought that it was the fiscal who wanted to put the patient into the Somers Hospital, whereas it was the prison doctor. And the second thing is he didn't notice the man had... They pointed out injuries on his hands, but he didn't notice that these were old injuries, not recently um, produced injuries. And he uh, blamed and wrote nasty letters about the fiscal to Lord Charles, and the fiscal took, took uh, um, exception to this. And um, eventually the thing went on. There was an inquiry, and Barry refused to go and, uh, to the inquiry and give evidence, and it just rolled on until finally um, Lord Charles uh, dismissed Barry from his post and also curtailed, at the same time, curtailed the... Um, the uh, activities in which the fiscal could become um, involved, because he was all-powerful, uh, the uh, de 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 fiscal. Um, <coughs> it is possi thought possibly that Barry was a sort of sacrificial sacking, because if he, the fiscal alone had been sacked, um, there would have been, it would have been thought that the, that, the governor, that Lord, the governor was trying to get at him. But if Barry, who was his favourite, was also being sacked at the same time, they could see that it wasn't preferential treatment giving, given to one and not the other one. That, is, that was the thought at the time. I am not in a position to comment. Ex and mix, as they say. Um, <coughs> right, it was during this time... It was during this time that Jeremiah Bultley, remember him? Yes. Barry's father. Things hadn't gone well for Jeremiah Bultley, and my colleague Jeremy um, Dronfield found out from a, an unusual website that he was, Jeremiah Bultley was on a prison a convict ship called Medina, named after the river on the Isle of Wight, bound for Australia and he, in rough weather he, in the South Atlantic in the roaring 40s he tripped and fell and in, injured his wrist and the, the, there's a ship, the, the ship surgeon records the treatment given to that but there's no re record of Jeremiah Bultley getting off the ship at the other end so presumably he, the, he might have got some sepsis or something and in those days there was no treatment and it looks as though Jeremiah Bulkley died in, uh, at that time, um, in uh, 1824, I think it was. <coughs> right, so when Barry was... Um, uh, um, uh, was dismissed from his post, he went back into the arms of the army as an ordinary army medical officer, and uh, as it was, he was out of office and out of power. And it was a quieter time for Barry, and he once more found himself as an assistant surgeon to the garrison, simply doing general practice in an army. So the army men, the wives, the kids, and that sort of thing. It included every possible consequence of fights, fornication, and flogging. The nearest actual battle was, uh, would have been uh, out on the border, a few assegai wounds, and there were medical officers there to deal with those sort of things. Um, VD was very common. Uh, sorry, um, that's an, an old-fashioned expression. Se sexually transmitted disease uh, was very common. <clears throat> but syphilis and gonorrhea couldn't be um, separated at the time, and they often occurred at the same time anyway. And as soon as a patient had one of those or both those, they were admitted to the hospital. And the, f the, f the, the figures, the annual figures of men who were admitted with VD was 436. And that's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of VD. If you see every, they, every month, 36 men contracted venereal disease and was admitted to hospital. So if you have all these men in hospital, it means that the rest of the army, have some other soldiers have to do their duty for them. And so there was a strong imperative to try to solve the problem. Um, and so 90 men were admitted for treatment, one every four days or so. Um, <coughs> Oh, I see. Right, you are. Okay, well, let's... let's the Barry uh, looked at that. Let's have the next slide, please. Next one. 
um, the flo this is flogging. When flogging took place, the doctor was in charge of the outcome. So if he thought the man was getting flogged too much, it was he, not the officer, who could stop it. And the next slide shows you the sort of scars, the keloid scars you can find on the back of a man who'd been flogged. Um, let's have the next slide, please. But looking for a cure for VD, Barry ex uh, investigated this uh, plant, which uh, I don't have any botanists here, Octopus echinatus. Um, and it has a, a root which looks a bit like, um, next slide please, it looks a bit like a parsnip and this was thought to contain uh, the uh, effective um, uh, material. But um, uh, it was not, it, it has been proved pharmacologically to be uh, without here. Um, now, uh, this is Barry's, as it were, his uh, saving grace or his, his his, his, um, tip. in uh, the 25th of July, this date, 1826, he did undertook a caesarean section in Weinberg at a place where that little school is. There's a little school from the still schools where the Munich house was. And um, next slide, please. Um, Mrs. Munich here, this is when Thomas Munich, his wife, was in labor. She'd been in labor for several days and she was in trouble. Um, and Barry was called in and he did a, next slide please, he, sorry, that is Munich the father, Thomas Munich, he was a snuff merchant, next slide, and that is a, a picture, a contemporary picture of a baby being delivered by a cesarean section. And Barry did this and it was remarkable because it was the first time in the British Empire that uh, both the mother and the child had actually survived a cesarean section. Um, there was, next slide, in, uh, he was asked, Barry was offered um, uh, to be one of the child's godfathers and he presented this very precious uh, miniature portrait of himself to the family as a gift and the family still treasure that to this day. Their eldest son is always called James Barry Munich and if one dies, the next son to be bald, born is give, given the same name. Next slide, please. This is interesting. <coughs> this is, um, <coughs> does this name mean anything to anybody? He was the first uh, prime nationalist prime minister in about the late, 1820s, in the late 1920s, I think. General Herzog. And he was called James Barry Munich Herzog because this is James Barry Munich, and he, this is Albert, uh, Al, Albert Munich Herzog. And when this boy was small, his mother died.